Okay, so we're doing our study on prayer, and we're continuing to look at prayers from the Bible. This time we're in the New Testament. We finished with the Gospels. Now we continue on with the rest of the New Testament. So we're on page 18. Um, and the next one that we come to after the Gospels is post-resurrection with the early church. And so Luke gives us both his Gospel and its sequel. So before we get to the sequel, at the very end of Luke, uh, we have, that address is wrong, it's not Luke chapter 1. This is uh, at, at the end of the Gospel. Uh, they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem. That, that's probably Acts, Acts 1, yeah, verse 12. They returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And when they entered, they went to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and, Zut and Judas the son of James. All these, with one accord, devoted themselves to prayer, together with the women and the Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So it's interesting, when we get the opening of uh, uh, the Acts of the Apostles, um, after the ascension, uh, they go back to Jerusalem. What do they do? They pray. Now Jesus, before he ascended, had told them to go back to Jerusalem and to wait upon the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. He didn't explicitly, as far as the record that we have, tell them to pray, but that's intuitively what they understood that he was asking them to do, hold a kind of prayer vigil of waiting for the promised outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So what we imagine they might have been doing is, first of all, keeping the regular routine of Jewish prayer that they had been accustomed to uh, all of their lives, and then in addition to that, asking perhaps for some um, particular blessings that might come through this outpouring of the Holy Spirit uh, and, and just expectations of what was to come. And one of the things that they noticed is, well, we have 12 tribes of Israel. We've talked about the kingdom and Jesus is the Messiah and he's the son of David. He comes to renew the kingdom. Now we have 11. And we really need 12 patriarchs of a renewed Israel. And so it seems like we're down one number. Maybe during this intervening time, this vigil of prayer, maybe that's one of the things we should be praying about. It might have been something that the Holy Spirit specifically, uh, you know, tapped somebody on the shoulder and said, well, don't you notice that you're 11 now and not 12? Maybe you ought to bump that back up to 12. And so this brings some initiative to Peter. So Peter notices this, and he discerns that during this intervening time, they should fill the vacancy. And so it says they put forward two, two candidates, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And, and one of the criteria was that this, these two candidates were somebody who had uh, always been with the Lord from the beginning, and were witnesses of his resurrection. This is basically the fundamental element of what an apostle is, someone who can be a witness to the resurrection and to Jesus' identity. So they came up with two, and they prayed, and then we get the text of their prayer, and they said, Lord, who knowest the hearts of all men, show which one of these two thou hast chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. Now, what is his own place? His own place is hell. That's where Judas went, turned aside to. If Judas was an apostle and was a faithful apostle who had died, he wouldn't be replaced. We know that because all of the other apostles, when they died, they weren't replaced. They were succeeded by bishops, but there were no new apostles to come take their places. There was 12 on 12 thrones, and dead or alive, they're always alive in Christ, and they will be raised again from the dead at the last day. So there's 12 thrones, 12 apostles. <clears throat> and they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was enrolled with the 11 apostles. Now, it might sound a little bit odd to us, 
uh, that they decided to do it this way. Uh, so they didn't take a vote. Um, they kind of let God vote. Uh, they cast lots. They sort of rolled the dice and put it up to chance. It's interesting that, um, as far as I know, this is the only situation where this is uh, the case, but in the election of the Patriarch of Alexandria, Egypt, the Coptic Patriarch, they still do the final vote tally by, um, by chance. Um, I, I forget exactly what the method is, but maybe they draw a name out of a hat or cast lots or something like that. And I think uh, they have the child pull the, pull the name out of the hat. So they figure like, well, the most innocent person who's not going to be, you know, persuaded to cheat or anything like that. And that's how they do it today. They put forward candidates who are capable and, and uh, just like we did here, but they leave it up to chance. And that's not so far removed from the Old Testament precedent, because what we had in the Old Testament is the Urim and Thummim, which are basically tools of chance like this to discern God's will. So we figure, we'll ask God a question, we'll roll the dice, he'll indicate by how it turns out what he wants. And then they go back to their prayer vigil. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And so not just abstractly to praying, but to the prayers. In other words, those daily prayers that they had always prayed as a part of their Jewish heritage. And in addition to that, you would expect they're probably adding something like that prayer that Jesus taught them one time when he said, pray our Father who art in heaven, and so on. So that's the first glimpse we get into the window of prayer life in the early church, is this intervening novena between the Lord's ascension and the coming of the Holy Spirit. Fast forward a little bit after that, Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 23. When they were released, the, the apostles, I think uh, Peter and I forget who else, and they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together with, to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who didst make heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who by the mouth of our father David, thy servant, did say by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples imagine vain things? That comes from Psalm uh, 2, by the way. And did say by the Holy Spirit, oh, sorry, uh, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth set themselves in array, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against thy holy servant Jesus, whom thou didst anoint, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever thy hand and thy plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats, and grant to thy servants to speak thy word with all boldness, while thou stretchest out thine hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of thy holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and spoke the word of God with boldness. So interestingly, we get this second little window into the prayer life of the early church. And one of the things we notice is that when they pray, they turn back to the previous promises of God from the Old Testament. In this case, they turn to Psalm 2, where they see a prophecy of the situation that they encounter in their own day and time, with the Gentiles and the rulers taking counsel, plotting, conspiring against God and against His anointed. Of course, the Messiah means the anointed one of God. And this emboldens their faith, and so they pray that even with this conspiracy and this uh, force of people who have power who are arrayed against us. Lord, we trust in you, and we pray that you would continue to work signs and wonders and healings as we continue to be bold in testifying to the truth, which is why they got in trouble in the first place, and it is through uh, the intervention of the Holy Spirit that they feel that they have been set free 
to go out and do it all over again and get in trouble all over again. And they're going to keep on praying and keep on trusting in God uh, to keep them safe and fulfill His will. And then we find the next prayer being uttered by St. Stephen uh, at his martyrdom. And so, you know, they have some early encounters, some early scuffles with the authorities, and it, it always tends to work out. They're always set free. Uh, they may be imprisoned for a little bit. They may be roughed up a little bit, but they're released to go back and, and do it all over again. But here, Stephen pays the ultimate price. And it's interesting that they had, uh, they had sensed the need um, for some more help in the leadership of the church. The apostles were called to preach the word, and they're like, we can't distract ourselves with all this busy work. Uh, we need to bring on some more help. So they called some deacons, some servants, to come and do the help. And it's, it's odd because the apostles were supposed to be the ones who are out talking, and yet they bring on this talker. Uh, they brought on somebody to serve tables, as it says, but Stephen seems to be more of a talker than any of them, and he goes out and gets himself good and uh, killed by his talking because he's bold in testifying to Jesus, and he's bold in sticking it in everybody's face who um, had brought Jesus to the cross and so on. And so we pick up in Acts chapter 7, verse 59 and 60, and they were stoning Stephen, or sorry, as they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. In other words, he died. And it's interesting that in Stephen's final hour, when he knows that he's done for, he's at the hand of this mob and they're not going to let him go, he turns to his recollection of what Jesus had encountered in his last hour at the cross and the, and the kinds of things that Jesus had prayed for. And so he basically pulls that out of his recollection and makes that his own prayer. Jesus has said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And so Stephen prays, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And Jesus had prayed, Lord, forgive them. They, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And so Stephen says, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. And so the source of Jesus' own, or sorry, the source of Stephen's own prayers is the modeling of Jesus himself. That makes sense because Jesus was the one who had taught them to pray, our Father, and so on. One of the very interesting things that we get comes next in Acts chapter 13, verses 2 and 3. Now we saw earlier that Peter had discerned that they were supposed to have 12 apostles, so they had a vacancy to fulfill, and they cast lots to figure out which candidate uh, God wanted. But here, God speaks up, and he speaks up in their worship, and he gives them direction. So Acts 13, verses 2 and 3, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, and there's kind of a hidden behind the translation, a more familiar term, liturgion, while they were engaged in the liturgy of the Lord and fasting. So this is the, the official worship. It's not just they happen to be having some prayer time. This is, no, like a Sunday morning, they're engaged in the Eucharistic liturgy and they're fasting. So they're seeking direction already. The Holy Spirit speaks up and said, set apart for me, or ordain for me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So perhaps the note there about fasting and praying is some maybe further discernment about, you know, was this really God's will? You know, I discerned this, but did you discern that as well? So it could be some further verification or it could be a note about uh, there's some intervening time when perhaps they're kind of getting ready and preparing themselves, and people are praying for God's blessing upon them and upon their mission and upon uh, whatever gifts of the Holy Spirit that they need to empower them. And we note that um, 
they are ordained and sent off with uh, praying and the laying on of hands. So that ancient ritual of conveying authority uh, from the Old Testament is used in ordaining Saul or Paul and Barnabas. So like when uh, Moses uh, ordains his successor, Joshua, he lays his hands upon him and prays for him. Uh, we have other uh, commissioning of prophets and priests through the laying on of hands. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, there is even a ceremonial laying on of hands for the Levites, even though you don't have to be you don't have to volunteer or be chosen to be a Levite. You're just a Levite because your dad was a Levite. You know, It's a family thing. The family business was the priesthood. But I think even still then, there had to be a, a ceremonial conveying of authority. So you're already chosen, as it were, but you still have to be imparted with the gifts. Um, similarly, in the way we do things today, we don't have a family lineage of the priesthood business but there are those who are chosen, but they don't have authority to act until they're given that authority by the laying on of hands and the prayer for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So next we find uh, prayer coming up in the New Testament in Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 26. Paul says, Likewise, the, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts of men knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So a very interesting way that Paul puts it there, about the Holy Spirit being active on the inside of us, helping us to pray. So God is not just on the other end listening, but he's also within us, helping us to articulate uh, what we ought to pray for. And like Paul says, you know, often we, we don't know how to pray. We don't know what to pray for. We don't know how to say it. Uh, but the Holy Spirit is on the deepest recesses of our being. So he knows us, and he's able to articulate sometimes what we can't articulate, to put into words what we can't put into words. The Spirit intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. For some reason, it makes me think to uh, Pope John Paul II in some of his uh, later days when he would be in uh, the liturgy and he would, you could tell he was in some discomfort, in, in pain, and he would be kind of uh, hunched over and, and just kind of groaning. But I don't think he was so much groaning about, Lord, you know, take away this stomachache or whatever I've got. I think it was, he was burdened with um, the situation that he was at. You know, he was at some youth day rally or he was at some, you know, canonization of a new saint or something like that. And he's praying for the people who are gathered there. Uh, and the Holy Spirit is working within him in his infirmity, helping him uh, do what he needs to do and pray what he needs to pray. And I think if we look back to our own experience a lot of times in life, you know, God has been there on the inside, not just on the other end, helping us to uh, be able to pray when we don't feel like it. <clears throat> Next time we encounter Paul's message on prayer is 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 10. And we can identify with this, too, because Paul prays for God to take away some physical ailments. He says, And to keep me from being too elated by the abundance of revelations, that is, to keep me from being puffed up and become arrogant by, I'm the one who's always getting direction from the Holy Spirit, I'm the one who always has the answers, and so on. He says, A thorn was given me in the flesh, and he never exactly reveals what that is, but it's, you know, a, th a thorn, something uncomfortable, in the flesh, something physical. So something physical and uncomfortable to distract him, to humble him, was given to him. 
He says, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I besought the Lord about this, that it should leave me. That, in other words, that he would heal me of this thing or take away this problem. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. I will all the more gladly boast of my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I think this is one of the most poignant and powerful uh, of all of uh, Paul's letters. This one part about his own experience with suffering and with wanting to be rid of it, wanting God to take it away, and God says no. And sometimes we ask for things, and we ask for things that are not unreasonable. We ask for things that are perfectly reasonable and expected, and yet sometimes the answer is no. And this is Paul's own experience and also his sharing of how he learned the wisdom of it that he understood why God said no. Sometimes we can't understand why God might deny some request. Sometimes we don't. But we have to learn to be content either way. And so Paul says, I learned how to be content with this. I learned the wisdom of it. And so I will all the more gladly boast of all my weaknesses because I know that even through my weaknesses, and maybe even especially through my weaknesses, God is demonstrating His power, his love, his generosity, his grace. It's interesting that that line that he gets from the Lord, that message that he gets from the Lord, my grace is sufficient for you. You know, my goodness, my loving kindness is more than you will ever need. In First Thessalonians 5, 16, this is something we mentioned in the uh, gospel or the uh, sermon today with the idea of the Jesus prayer, is uh, pray without ceasing. Uh, so this comes in uh, a little litany. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And so that charge there, that challenge, pray without ceasing, has long been a focus of particularly monastic life. So how do you put that into effect? Well, that's kind of a mystery, and it might be a, kind of a different answer for everybody. Pray without ceasing. To me, it, it, it uh, brings up the image of uh, prayer like being on the telephone line with God. And that is, if you're going to pray without ceasing, it doesn't mean that you're always t constantly talking, but it means that you never hang up. You know, the line is always open. And um, people have tried to cultivate prayer practices like the Jesus Prayer, uh, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Try to match this with your breathing, with your inhale and your exhale. So, I mean, you're always going to be breathing, so you'll always be praying. If it's something you kind of link to things that you do intuitively without thinking about. Another thing is you try to attach things that you always do to moments uh, that turn your attention toward God. Um, Things that, you know, like eating and brushing your teeth and getting dressed and waking up in the morning. And, you know, all these things, they just happen. Why not use them as little tools of the trade to help turn your mind toward God? And I think at the bottom line, that's, to me, what this is really all about, is always being mindful of your relationship with the Lord. To pray without ceasing, to me, is essentially that, to always be mindful of of the Lord in all things, to know that you're never alone. Just like if you're always in the company of one person, you're always mindful that they're there. And you sure are mindful if one day they're not. So it is in our relationship with the Lord, praying without ceasing. Well, the next time we get uh, some word is 2 Timothy 1, uh, verses 16 through 18. And this is very interesting. Uh, because here we find Paul's prayer for a recently departed friend. So he's, this is the one 
example we get in the New Testament of someone praying for the dead. He says, May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me. He was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me eagerly and found me. May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day, that is, Judgment Day, Day of the Resurrection. And you well know all the service he rendered at Ephesus. And so verse 18 is his prayer for Onesiphorus, who has recently died. May the Lord grant him to find mercy on that day, the day of resurrection. And that's basically always our prayer for the departed, and frankly, our prayer for the living. May God have mercy on this person. Lord have mercy is basically the fundamental prayer that we pray for everyone. Uh, as I recall, in our uh, section on uh, uh, catechetical material about uh, prayer, we have, I think, he mentions... This is in a different handout here. And the Catechism of Pius X. There's somewhere where he talks about praying for the dead. Anyway, I don't see it here. I know he mentions it somewhere. It's probably just not in the, uh, in the questions. But in the, uh, in the prayer book, which I don't have, there's one. Let me grab this. Because it's worth quoting exactly, because it says it so well. In the closing section on the Christian hope, it's on uh, page 864, uh, if anyone wants to go back and look at it. It says, why do we pray for the dead? And in a sense, it's asking, what do we pray when we pray for the dead? It says, we pray for them because we still hold them in our love. So that makes sense, you know. You pray for the people you care about. We still care about them, even though they're dead. It would be totally counterintuitive to our loving relationship to stop praying for someone dear to us just because they died. So we, and that makes sense with Paul right here with Onesiphorus. He prayed for him all the time when he was alive. Why would he stop praying for him now? He continues to pray for him. So we pray for them because we still hold them in our love. And then, what are we praying for? And because we trust that in God's presence, those who have chosen to serve him will grow in his love until they see him as he is. And so, it's very similar to Paul's prayer here for Anesiphorus, praying for God's mercy, that they would be blessed by God, that their relationship with God would be nurtured and continue on to grow in the life hereafter. In Hebrews chapter 4, beginning in verse 14, we have this wonderful image illustrating uh, the prayer life uh, of Jesus. Prayer as entering into the sanctuary, entering into the throne room of heaven. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we have not a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So coming to God in prayer is like coming into God's throne room and kneeling down and asking for favor, asking for mercy. In this case, asking for grace. Do we know who wrote Hebrews? No. It's anonymous. In the Western Church, it became attributed to Paul, and parts of it sound very Pauline, but it's never, you know, usually a letter at the beginning will say, I, Paul, the servant of the Lord, am writing to so-and-so. So maybe there was a, a, a first page that got ripped off somewhere, or maybe it was just meant to be anonymous. Yeah. Written by who? Well, we don't know. Hebrews is anonymous. It doesn't tell us. But I said, would you think that at least to believe that they were written by the suffering Christ? 
Well, it's certainly written by a Christian, yeah, because that's the perspective throughout. And it might be written to Jewish Christians because it alludes a lot to Judaism and to, especially to temple uh, Judaism. James also mentions prayer and much like this, you know, coming to the throne to ask for grace, asking for wisdom. James 1 verses 5 through 8, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives to all men generously and without reproaching and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways, will receive anything from the Lord. So here he makes two points. One is that wisdom comes from God, and so if you want wisdom, go to the source and ask for it, and God is generous in giving wisdom. And then the other thing is, is that God is generous in giving to those who come sincerely asking with faith. But those who um, are double-minded, those who don't have sincere faith, um, don't expect any favors from the Lord. And then we get into the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation has a lot of prayers in it. We're not going to go through all of those. Basically, the prayers that we get in Revelation are snippets of the liturgical life of heaven. So we see the angels and the saints bowing down and saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord, God of hosts. They're singing the song to the Lamb. Uh, Blessed is the Lamb who sits on the throne to receive power and glory and wisdom and strength and honor and blessing and so on. So there's a lot of that. And in most Bibles, those will be kind of set off in, in you know, different text, uh, it'd be indented or in different type or something like that. So you can kind of see what are the quotes from the liturgical prayer life of heaven. But here we also have a few notes about some interesting uh, tidbits um, of how prayer works. So Revelation 8, verse 3, Another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to mingle with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar before the throne. And so heaven, uh, well, back up, the, the temple on earth in Jerusalem is meant to be kind of a microcosm of the cosmos. It's, it's meant to resemble the heavenly temple. And so there's an altar in the earthly temple, there's an altar in the heavenly temple, and one of the altars is for burning incense. And the duties of the angels are to come and present the prayers of God's people before the throne, and when it says that they're mingled with incense, there's a couple of th dynamics happening. So in, in the psalm, I forget which one, um, but it says, let my prayer be set forth in your sight as the incense, the lifting up of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. When we see the incense rise up before God, like the smoke that comes out of the thurible, it's a reminder of how our prayers ascend up to God and go close to him. And also the sweet smell is a reminder of how our prayers are pleasing to God. So when you smell something pleasant, it kind of puts you in a good mood, makes you feel nice. Well, our prayers put God in a good mood. Uh, they make him feel um, pleasant. And so when our prayers are mingled with the incense, it's a reminder that they ascend up to heaven, that they are presented by the angels, and that they are pleasing to God. And it's interesting that the closing lines of the Bible are a prayer. So this is from almost the very end, Revelation 22, verse 20. The last prayer of the Bible. <clears throat> he who testifies to these things says, that is Jesus, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus. And that's basically how the Bible concludes, with a prayer for Jesus' second coming. Any thoughts or questions as we wrap that up? I can look up some other examples of prayer from Revelation. We also might say that um, the 
correspondence of John with the angel who is guiding him through this is a prayer. That he was talking to the angel. And I didn't make a note of it, but um, oftentimes uh, evangelicals would point to the part where uh, John kneels down before him and the angel says, oh, don't worship me, I'm just an angel. And they'll say that's, that's a, a teaching against praying to the angel. And they don't seem to grasp that he's been praying to the angel the whole time and he continues to pray to the angel. The angel just says, don't worship me. And we can all agree with that. We're not supposed to worship the angels. We're supposed to worship God. Sometimes we might get carried away. And so the angel says, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. You're, you're going too far. I'm just the messenger. Pray to God or ask, uh, worship God. Let me give some examples of prayers. Some of those liturgical things. It's interesting also that they, they pray for vengeance. Uh, the martyrs who are uh, crying out from the altar, they're buried, basically their remains are placed inside the altar. And so they're crying out for vengeance, for God to come down and get involved. And we have several times in the Bible where a metaphor is used about crying out for vengeance uh, to God. A voice came from the throne, give praise to our God, all you his servants who fear him, small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, like the sound of many waters and the sound of mighty peals of thunder, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him the victory and glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. And so that's the kind of things that we get in Revelation, these passages of praise to God, mostly um, from the angels and from the saints. Well, we will leave it with that, and we will, I forget exactly what we will talk about next time. Let's see if I got it uh, on the handout here, what our next topic is. It's kind of taken longer to go through We'll probably, yeah, we'll probably talk about the Psalter next time, the Psalms, the big prayer book of the Bible, and then talk about the development of the daily office, which is basically built around the recitation of the Psalms. So stay tuned, and we'll talk more about prayer.